Um, oh, it's about the magic, the magical thinking, like the willingness to not believe reality. I mean, it's so poisonous. It's it's the most frustrating uh, experience for me as an American citizen to see people I know believing nonsense and lies and you can't counter it with truth. It's, I don't know how to deal with that. I honestly don't. And, and I just simply decide to not talk to some people. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the uh, you know, the fairy tale quality of, of the Torah's, uh, you know, the Bible stories, you know, um, in, in a certain sense, they are that kind of really meditation on people are really can be some people <laughs> really can be absolutely impossible. And, uh, you know, we say it in the, in the Haggadah, if God hadn't taken us out, he never would have gotten out because there was no convincing. There was no convincing any, uh, you know, enough people that this is no good. And uh, the, the excuse making and the twisting of, uh, of uh, just finding any kind of thing to be able to then push it off and say, you know, so what, you know, so what about this? I mean, a lot of what happens with Pharaoh's, uh, uh, Pharaoh and Pharaoh's advisors uh, or magicians or whatever, it's a kind of a what about it? You know, like when you say, don't, you know, what, this is wrong. Oh yeah, what about this? So it's mm -hmm. a kind of a creating these false, uh, um, you know, comparisons or correlatives um, in order to be able to then simply hold on to what you want to hold on to. Um, so the argument is irrelevant. The argument is totally irrelevant. It's all about just maintaining what you are, have, have so deeply dived into as, as part of what you, you know, what you uh, see has to be. Actually, uh, some research has sort of suggested that trying to present facts to convince somebody otherwise is actually counterproductive and just yeah, makes right. people just believe more um, and, you know, I don't want to get engaged in false equivalences, but you know, one recognizing that, but also really being mindful that, that this is the human brain can do this, um, you know, and sort of thinking about my own beliefs and biases and, and such, you know, to try and not fall into those um, same traps. I mean, Lou has this, he's had patients who have talked about the fact that COVID, you know, Oh, that's all fake. It doesn't, you know, it's not really true. Um, he's their doctor telling, you know, when he, you know, he's there wearing a mask. You know, they haven't seen any, they haven't seen anything but his eyes for how long now? And they're, you know, why do they think he's doing that? Yeah. Because he's a victim of uh, false news. That's right. You know, he, oh. he's the victim, not not them. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's why what I did try to frame it in in is terms of so what really are you committed to let's say you know pe religious people are also accused of never being able to be argued with no amount of evidence will ever prove to a religious person that their religious beliefs are untrue so good so i plead guilty so but what my what my fallback position is okay so what am i then choosing to believe what is it that I want to commit myself to. Um, and uh, you have to own it. You have to own what, you're, what you are. I don't care. You know, you're going to argue with me from here till, till doomsday that I'm wrong, but I'd rather be wrong and not kill poor, more people and not separate families and not uh, um, you know, deny other people uh, their freedom. I'd rather be wrong and not do those things than um, you know, then do them. So, so what are you committed to? So, you know, what are what are what are the Egyptians committed to? What are what is Pharaoh actually really committed to? And of course, you know, in our own country, the Pharaoh that we have is is not committed to anything except himself. But what are the other people committed to? What are all the people uh, actually committed to? And and some of the, I I usually don't, I avoid reading the papers during the week. I avoid, I don't watch TV and stuff like that, but I actually did watch some of the debate 
um, about the impeachment. And from my perspective, the, the arguments for the people who did not want to impeach um, really didn't confront. So what, are, what exactly besides this idol that you've put up um, to worship the Fuhrer, to worship this, this you know, uh, this perfect uh, leader of all times, um, what are you really believing? What, what are you actually supporting? Um, it, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite extraordinary. In terms of this uh, Torah portion, what we have uh, is um, it starts va'era, or the, you know the correct pronunciation these days va'era. Um, I appeared. This is God speaking to uh, Moses, and it's actually a continuation of God's response to Moses at the very end of last week's Torah portion, where Moses goes, "I give up. Why are you sending me to Pharaoh?" Uh, all it does is make things worse, and 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 the Israelites are complaining to me, and I and I have to say that this is just, you know. So what what are you doing here? And uh, God starts answering last week and says, "Easy, easy, does it? I'm with you. It's going to take some time." And then the beginning of this week's Torah portion is a continuation of that of that speech, and uh, talks about. The change, the change in the experience or the apprehension of God between the patriarchs and the present generation. And God makes the very radical uh, claim that uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no matter how much they were, you know, close to me and uh, the pillars literally of, of, the, of the beginning of, of, uh, of, the, of the, the Jewish way, they didn't actually really experience me the way you will be experiencing me. They, he says, my name was actually not really known to them fully the way it is gonna be known to now. So I've talked about that, I've written about it, but anyway, that's where we start from. And then he says, therefore, you just have to hold on and you have to keep persisting and you have to keep fighting and it's not gonna work so well and Pharaoh is not gonna be a pushover, but you have to keep on doing it. And then we get into the confrontations with Pharaoh. Um, and uh, the, what I wrote about the, the, the famous, you know, uh, contest with, the, with the, the, uh, the, the, the staffs, the rods that turn into, uh, we usually call it a snake, but it probably it's more correct to call it a crocodile, a tanin, not a nachash. And uh, so we have that. And then we get into the plagues. And the rest of the Torah reading is the first seven plagues. And uh, just as a spoiler, eventually there'll be 10 plagues. So, uh, but uh, we've got uh, most of them in, in, in our Torah reading. So that's where we are. That's the, that's basic, that, that is a, you know, a general outline of everything that we've got. Um, so, uh, if something is is very particularly, uh, an, uh, you know, a topic that you want to uh, focus on, speak up now. All right, that's it. That's it, Tomo. That's you. You've lost your chance. So let's talk plagues. Um, and uh, I'm gonna uh, try this out. I'm gonna try to do a screen sharing. Okay, can you see that? That's a too, that's enlarged too much. Wait, I'm gonna make the page, hopefully is, it doesn't fit on your screen. Yeah, uh, it's um, too big. It's too big. So the, the first column is cut off. So making it- Perfect, yeah, perfect, that's perfect, better. perfect, yeah, perfect. That's better. All right. So this is a, 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 a table that was uh, that, uh, printed by Nachum Sarna many, many years ago. He wrote a book called Exploring Exodus. And um, he, uh, um, he talks about, forget, he says, you know, he talks about P 
people have all kinds of scientific naturalistic explanations for how the plagues really happened and what happened and so on. He goes, yeah, no, no, yeah, whatever. He says, but if we actually look at the way that the Torah um, presents these, um, these plagues, we can notice a kind of a, 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 a literary uh, uh, thoughtfulness. Hold on a second. Um, in the way uh, that, that, it's, that is divided up. So as you can see here, there are 10 plagues and there are three series of three plagues each. And then of course the final uh, plague of all plagues. So, and he says, if you really compare the, with the verses um, and, and the text, we can notice that there is a repeating pattern that uh, goes on once, twice, three times. So the first series, um, are the first three plagues, which are in our Torah portion. The second series is the next three pages which are in our Torah portion. And then the third series, uh, we, we, we have number seven um, in, in our Torah portion as well. So, um, and he gives you the verses. This is Exodus starting in the middle of chapter seven and going through uh, into chapter nine uh, in, in, um, you know, in the depiction of the plagues. The, the Torah portion itself, Va'era, starts in chapter six. So anyway, what he shows is he divides it up that going, uh, moving over to the right, forewarning. Is there a forewarning to the plague? And what we see is that it goes the first plague, the second plague, yes, yes, then no. Then the next one, yes, yes, then no then yes, yes, then no. So um, that's the, uh, um, the, 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 the rhythm of this stuff. And then he shows in the next two columns that they're also very distinct um, um, repeating patterns mm -hmm. for other things. The time indication of the warning and the formula, the words that are used keep on actually being used again and again the same way. So what he's, what he's showing us is that the, the plagues are, are, are a system. There's a kind of a recurring uh, uh, rhythm to the plagues that uh, um, God keeps on putting out again and again and again. Except also we also get a change or a process in the, um, the agent who puts who who initiates the plague? So you have in the first three plagues it's Aaron. Then the next two plagues, God does it. Then we've got Moses, 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 and then God again. All right. So the question then is: Okay, we notice a pattern. We 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 discern this kind of a pattern. What does it mean? What does this pattern uh, convey to us? What, what, what possible uh, message um, is this a code for? Right? That's, that's the implication, that this is set up in a, in a kind of a, um, a code. So anybody have any ideas about this? Let's, let's uh, go to 714 and let's look at the text and let's see how this gets fleshed out a little bit, okay? So chapter seven, verse 14. Okay, and it, he's, it goes 14 through 24. Somebody wanna um, volunteer to read, please? I'll read. Okay, thank you. Okay. Page 358, if you have the Eitz Chaim. Yes. Chapter seven, bottom of the page, for verse 14. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. I just want to again, uh, uh, as I often do, point out the Hebrew is this very uh, important, uh, bring, introduces, and it's not just, it's, it's been had this, this motif. It's, there's a motif here that 
has been actually introduced before, and it's here again. Kaved Lev Paro. Pharaoh's heart is heavy or strong, um, and they're translating it as stubborn, but it's it's go, cutting straight into, into Pharaoh's heart. Go ahead. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is coming out to the water and station yourself before him at the edge of the Nile, taking with you the rod that turned into a snake. And say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you to say, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness, but you have paid no heed until now. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. See, I shall strike the water in the Nile with the rod that is in my hand, and it will be turned into blood, and the fish in the Nile will die. The Nile will stink, so that the Egyptians will find it impossible to drink the water of the Nile. Keep going. And the Lord, yeah, through 24. Yeah. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod and hold out your arm over the waters of Egypt, its rivers, its canals, its ponds, all its bodies of water that they may turn to blood. There shall be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. He lifted up the rod and struck the water in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and his courtiers. And all the water in the Nile was turned into blood and the fish in the Nile died. The Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And there was blood throughout the land of Egypt. But when the Egyptian magicians did the same with their spells, Pharaoh's heart stiffened and he did not heed them as the Lord had spoken. Pharaoh turned and went into his palace, paying no regard even to this. And all the Egyptians had to dig around about the Nile for drinking water because they could not drink the water of the Nile. Okay, thank you. So um, takeaways from the text and comparing it also to our uh, uh, table here. Um, what do, what do we what do we uh, perhaps discern in in what's going on here? What 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 is being uh, conveyed to Pharaoh to us to the children of Israel? What's God up to here? First of all, what's being attacked? Water. The all, all, water. all water is all water being attacked. No. The Nile. The Nile, right? The implication at the end is that they may actually be able to find, it's not clear, when they start digging around to try to find other water, it's not clear, Can they, is, are they successful in finding other water or not? But it's definitely, absolutely in front of everybody's noses and eyes that the Nile has been stricken, right? But 19 makes us believe that, all, that others have been struck, stricken as well. Say that again. Verse 19 indicates that other bodies of water may have been stricken. Yeah, where does it say again? What does yeah, 19 yeah. say? What? Um, yeah. Right. It's rivers, it's canals, it's ponds, all its bodies of water. Right. All its bodies of water. That's the Nile, I guess. Right. So that anything, because of course the Nile is the main source of water and everything gets irrigated, everything gets, gets channeled out of the Nile um, to, uh, to, you know, to uh, give water to the rest of that desert light land. That's why it's called Egypt, you know, Mitzrayim in Hebrew, right? It's this narrow strait uh, of, uh, of water that, that, uh, that the banks, you know, then get, uh, uh, the banks of the Nile get, get uh, nourishment from. So, yeah, I, I, but the Nile is definitely the, the direct hit, right? Whether it applies to any other source of water, whether there is any other source of water is a good question. But uh, um, so God is hitting the Nile, right? Um, and um, um, so look, the at, look, at verse, look at verse 15 for a second. What does it say there? Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is coming out to the water and station yourself before him at the edge of the Nile, taking with you the rod that turned into a snake. Right. So the scene of the warning is also at the Nile and God knows that Pharaoh is gonna to go to the Nile, right? So the Nile is the, the focus here 
And the Nile, as everybody you know, has, has heard one way or another, the Nile is of course a god because the Nile is the source of life for Egypt. So the first blow that we have here is um, a direct hit against the, uh, um, the main source of life of all of Egypt that even Pharaoh needs to connect up with every day, right? So this is, this is um, God's message to Pharaoh. Um, if we don't believe in the Nile, at least we can be you know, uh, inspired by, oh, look, God is really giving it to him. You know, that was a, that was a, a you know punch that that landed perfectly right there on the jaw. So um, yes, yeah, Sarita. The station yourself is interesting because this is very public, and this is you know not going into his private audience room or anything like that. This is sort of interrupting him, um, you know, as he is about to 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 do this publicly. So um, yeah. Okay, let's let's skip now. Just let's see how well the correspondence, the parallelism works. Let's go now to chapter eight, verse 16, for the first plague of the second series. Why, why do they need Aaron? The good question. Let's hold on to that for, uh, uh, for a little later, okay? Okay. Um, verse, eight, 18, verse eight, uh, 16. 8, 16, which is on page 362. And the Lord said to Moses, Early in the morning, present yourself to Pharaoh as he is coming out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may worship me. For if you do not let my people go, I will let loose swarms of insects against you and your courtiers and your people and your houses, the houses of the Egyptians and the very ground they stand on shall be filled with swarms of insects. But on that day, I will set Apart the region of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of insects shall be there, that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. And I will make a distinction between my people and your people. Tomorrow the sign shall come to pass, and the Lord did so. Heavy swarms of insects invaded Pharaoh's palace and the houses of his courtiers throughout the country of Egypt. The land was ruined because of the swarms of insects. Okay, so let's leave it at that. Um, and uh, okay, what's uh, we do a compare and contrast. What do, what do we have that's uh, um, similar? What do we have that that's changed? Is the translation just missing the station yourself? Because he's still he's he's confronting. Oh, he's he has confronting. it. There it is. It's right there. Present yourself to Pharaoh as he's coming oh, out of the world. Present yourself. Okay, that's okay. So, um, yeah, in Hebrew, it's the same word. Okay, that's why, it, yeah. And before him. So it's there well, again with Pharaoh at the water. Right. So you, yeah. But what's the but what's the target this time? The ground. Yeah, it's not the Nile. Right. Right. Even though the Nile is still look, this is Egypt. The Nile is still the center of Pharaoh and 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 the and the Egyptian peoples. Um, you know, focus of connection. Uh, they need denial. Denial. That's that's old history now. Now, uh, God has has gone to the next step, right? Um, and and uh, the insects are are swarming all over the place. Um, okay, so we've got a similarity. Obviously, station yourself. We've got the difference, as it's pointed out, the agent here is God does something. Moses and Aaron, neither one of them do anything with their rod, right? Or am I wrong? Right? That's all. It's right. what happens. God is going to do this. Um, anything else to compare? Same time of day in the morning. Right. But there's one also, I think, one big difference. Right. It's, it's a, there's a it, it, there's an if statement in here. What? What's For if you do not let my people go, I will right. let loose. They right. don't have that. Oh. So you, in other words, you you're being warned. You can you can get out of this, right? You 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 maybe didn't believe me in the beginning. You've already gotten hit three times, <laughs> so that should be enough. No. So. So that's the forewarning. Right. That's the forewarning, and. Um, the difference is, um, you know, the Nile turning to blood affected everybody. Here, there's a difference between how the Egyptians are being treated and how the Israelites are being treated. Yes, 
The distinction is made explicit here. It's not clear before. Did all these other plagues, the first three plagues, did they affect the Israelites or not? It doesn't say one way or the other. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit, you know, uh, um, you know, are the Israelites collateral damage to use an ugly and, and cynical term? You know, um, God is trying to get the Israelites out of Egypt. Are they also, are they also going to be suffering from this? You know, when when uh, you know when there's you know carpet bombing, you know, on on something. So all these innocent people also suffer. So does God do that? But here God actually makes, so it's not clear before, but here it's absolutely clear. I'm not gonna let the Israelites suffer from this. Only you, only your people will suffer from this. So what we have, I think is, is if we can look at this, and now let's look at one, two, three, four. Let's look right. at one, two, three, four um, as a series, right? So one, two, three is a discrete, unit, and then four is the beginning of a new unit. So the new unit is making clear that this is God doing things and that the Israelites are not implicated in this. But one, two, three also has a progression. First denial is hit, right? The next is frogs, okay? So frogs are all over the place. And, uh, you know, I pointed out in, in, in Torah Sparks in the past, there's a kind of a, actually a, a swing back and forth. The blood in the Nile, that's, that's, real, that's horror show stuff, right? That's horror movies. Blood is, is uh, you know, is, is what gives us the chills, right? Some of us can't see any blood whatsoever, right? Frogs are, are maybe creepy, but maybe they're also cute. And, um, you know, when we have kids at the Seder, Frogs here, frogs there, frogs are jumping everywhere. We never sing blood here, blood there, blood was flowing everywhere. It's horrible. And we, there's frog toys. We have all of our frog toys. That's right. Are frogs there's, are like the are no like the most toys. the most beloved the most beloved piece of this of this whole you know the you know this is the that's the wonderful plague. It's the great plague. It makes it we can do the plagues without feeling bad because the because the frogs are jumpy and happy and cute. So there's this real interesting swing between the first plague and the second plague. Um, Except that, you know, the, they both actually, they both have to do with the Nile. I mean, the blood stays in the Nile. Right. And then the frogs start in the Nile, but then they come out of the Nile. Yeah. And they just take over everything. I mean, that right. really is creepy. Right. So, so the blood is a complete transformation of the Nile. It's completely unnatural uh, transformation of the Nile. The frogs are a natural feature of the, the water, the marshland near the water, but then they start taking over and you can't get rid of them and they're all over the place. So that's this creepiness that starts out as something innocuous or something natural, but then goes, you know, gets out of control, out of control. So, and then there's a big difference between those two plagues and the lice. What's the difference between the frogs and the lice? The lice are on your body. Yeah. The frogs are, you know, hopping in on, on your kitchen counter. They're, you know, you're walking to the store, you, 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 you know, you, you trip on a, on a, on a frog that, uh, that scares you or, you know, that, that surprises you, but, they don't infect you, right? The whole point of lice is that it's they personal. are, that, yes, it's absolutely a personal affliction. It's an invasion on your very body, into your hair, into your you know, private areas, into your pores. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural phenomenon, which is naturally un, unhappy and, and crummy and creepy. Um, and here it's out of control, but it, but it now it's on you. Um, if we study those of us that have been looking at Talmud, we're talking a little bit about the the, the affliction called leprosy, tzara'at. It's not leprosy, but there we have a similar progression. That first it goes. It's not the same progression, but first it affects your house. Then, if you still don't do repentance, it, it affects your own clothing that you're wearing. And then if you still don't repent, then it affects you, your skin. 
So this is like a, a, a coming closer and closer and closer. Even denial is central to your life, but it's denial. In fact, in a certain sense, denial is, is a God. It's not you, right? Then the frogs are this like ugly, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, uncanny, uh, uh, you know, invasion of the land. And then the lice are you. Of course, each, and se each one of these, as it gets worse and worse, they nevertheless, they go away, right? Each one stops. And each one is then giving Pharaoh a chance to say, okay, I give in. I give in. And he doesn't. Second series is, okay, look, I've done this progression. And now I'm going to start again. And the first one is the insect insects. So they're flying around. So now the air is, is taken over. We've had the, the water and, the, and the, the land with swarms of frogs. And then we have the air itself with these, uh, uh, with these insects. Um, and God is the one who brings that about. Um, and then uh, we get pestilence, which is um, something going on with uh, killing uh, um, uh, the, the animals or, or, uh, or rotting out the animals and perhaps even in, uh, um, infecting people. And then the boils is again, the body. So um, in this, um, the agent here is listed as God, um, but looking at um, boils, Right. Sorry, looking at, um, oh no, I'm sorry. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. I, I was looking at the wrong one. Um, Boyles is Moses. Um, right. Actually, yeah. So, so there's a little bit of a rhythm there that that uh, Moses ends up taking over the third one and then taking over all three in the third series. Um, maybe we can figure that out. Maybe not. Um, Alan asked before, what's what's the deal with Aaron? Why do we need Aaron here? One, one, one thing I noticed was that in the first three, Pharaoh's magicians try to replicate what Aaron right. did, and they gave up. After the third one. After the, after the third one. You didn't right. see I, I, I mean, I didn't go through all of them, but I just noticed that. That's the, it, the, right. The, after they, 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 can't, don't, they, they can't replicate it. Right. They so, finally admit maybe that's the transition that they, a, a real, they agree. That right. God is doing it. They, they say that. They say it, it's by Elohim. It's God's finger. Right. Uh, um, but but that's but, interesting because when they come back, um, when they come back to boils and, and now it's not God is the agent, it's it's Moses. Um, it actually talks about um, the fact that the magicians were unable to do anything um, because of the inflammation. So maybe um, again, with Moses being the agent, maybe the magicians sort of, for the God ones, oh, we can't do anything about that, but maybe they wanted to try again. If Moses is doing it, it's a person, but they were unable to. So the boils is chapter nine, verse eight. Yeah. Um, let's look at what you're, to, what you're uh, uh, um, referring to is verse 11. Yeah. Let's look at verse 11, chapter nine, compared to verse uh, um, 14 in uh, chapter eight. In chapter eight, 14, we have the lice. Now, the blood, the, the, the magicians make more blood. The frogs, the Egyptians make more, more frogs. And again, as I pointed out other times, this is self-destructive, right? But that doesn't matter. You know, the, in, if you really wanted to, to, to fight the plague, you should have the magicians make the blood go away, not make more blood, but that's part of this magical thinking, right? It's, I'm not gonna have to listen to you. It's not about the, the suffering, I'll, I'll suffer. I'll even make myself suffer more as long as I don't have to uh, take a message from you. As long as I don't have to learn a lesson from you, I don't care. But on a rational level, 
they should have been saying, let's get the frogs out of here. Let's get the, uh, let's get the, um, the blood out of here. Instead, by making frogs, what they're saying is, ah, you know, it's like, it's a little bit of a parallel of saying, you know what, this virus is not really so serious. It's basically just the flu. They don't care about people dying right and left as long as they don't have to take responsibility for it. But then when we get to the lice, chapter eight, verse 14, what does it say? The magicians did the like with their spells to produce lice, but they could not. The vermin remained upon man and beast. Okay, so they try to do it and they, and they fail. Now let's go to chapter nine and let's uh, see um, uh, verse 11. The magicians were unable to confront Moses because of the inflammation, for the inflammation afflicted the magicians as well as all the other Egyptians. So that's not the same thing, right? Right. The first one is a failure of the magicians to pull off the magic trick. What's this other re reference to the magicians now with the boils? That they're afflicted and they can't do anything about their own affliction. Right, they don't get the special treatment by the doctors with, these, with the magic uh, uh, you know, you know, serum, the treatment to, so that they won't get sick. They're getting sick like everybody else. They, they can't even show up in court because they are so sick with the boils. So it's not about their lack of magical uh, powers to counter this. This is about that the boils have hit the elite, right? So it's not only hitting the body, but it's also which bodies. It's not just hitting the essential workers. If we hit the essential workers and they all die, who cares? But now it's actually hitting the VIPs, right? It's hitting the important people, the magicians who supposedly have all kinds of superpowers to, uh, uh, you know, to protect themselves and they can't. It's a different, it's a different message, right? So, so the magicians have given up um, uh, doing anything starting with the third plague. Why is Aaron the one doing those three plagues? So the Midrash answers this question. And it says something actually very beautiful. Um, it says that since these uh, plagues um, begin with uh, the Nile, it would be wrong for Moses to be the one to attack the Nile mm -hmm. because Moses was saved by the Nile. Now, of course, that's you know it's a kind of a spin on the story. It's not like the Nile did its best to try to save Moses from uh, from drowning, but Moses um, has that kind of sentimental connection that mean makes it morally difficult for him to destroy the Nile. So that's how they understand why Aaron does it first. But we can see it also as just Aaron, of course, is is the second the second, uh, you know, Hancho, right? He is Moses' uh, right-hand man, right? In fact, that's why Moses agrees to take on the job. So in the beginning, he gets, he gets to be the warm-up act, right? That would be a different way of looking at it. He gets to be the one who's, who starts this process off. But as we start seeing, this process has layers and layers of um, um, deepening or intensifying uh, messages, right? Making it worse and worse, more and more pointed um, to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians um, about, about what, uh, what God is, is trying to tell them. And they keep on having the chance to back off. They're constantly having the chance to say, look, if we kidded ourselves before that this is a plague that, that, that happened to everyone, it's just a coincidence. Now God is saying, look, you're gonna be able to see that this is absolutely different. You will be affected. They won't be affected. Do you get the message? Can you get the hint or not? Can you put two and two together or not? And of course, it's not that they can't, it's that they refuse, right? They refuse to do it. Um, I, would, I would even argue that that very distinctive distinguishing feature of, of uh, the fourth plague 
that is brought about by God and not by Aaron is almost God saying, look, will you cut it out? You know, let's, let's go straight, let's cut straight to the chase. I, I'm gonna do this. So why fight with me, right? Let's call it off now. Why should you suffer even more? Why should your people suffer even more? Why are you digging in? Cut it out with, with the, you know, the, the biggest incentive, just don't mess with me um, to, uh, to back down. And of course, Pharaoh will not back down. And uh, then we start, uh, after those two, um, we get even more serious and more serious and more serious. So I'm noticing that um, for four and five, mm -hmm. and this God, there's a clear, a clear statement that this affects the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. Um, for the boils, it doesn't explicitly say that. And right. it say for the hail either. Hail. Right. And there's no forewarning, right? Right. There's, there, there's no forewarning um, coming. And is it because I, I would say, again, you have a kind of a, a ramping up. Don't you get, you know, if you don't get the hint again, that's it. You know, you, 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 you had your chance. I don't have to warn you now. You know, you blew it. And then we have another kind of reboot, right? The third series is, okay, let's start one more time. One more time, let's, let's, let's try it again, right? And that's seven, eight, and nine. And of course, to no avail um, uh, as, as we go on. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. In some cases, it says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Right. In other cases, it says Pharaoh's heart hardened without right. the Lord having done so. Right. I mean, maybe this Pharaoh guy, if Hashem, if the God had not hardened his heart, he wouldn't have hardened his heart. Right. So, the, so if you look at the text, if I'm not mistaken, it's pretty consistent. Pharaoh hardens his heart in the beginning, and we don't get to God hardening Pharaoh's heart until later. So the first part of it is um, when we get, we get it in chapter 9. Right, we get it in chapter nine um, for um, um, for the boils, right? That's when we first get it. Chapter nine, verse 12. Verse 12, that, yeah, the other ones, it also talks about him being stubborn himself. Right, until that, so if you look at, at uh, verse uh, um, seven, which is the previous plague, the pestilence, it says, go ahead, you got it? Yep, it says, when Pharaoh inquired, he found that not a head of the livestock of Israel had died, yet Pharaoh remained stubborn, and he would not let the people go. Right, and in Hebrew, it's the, the, the heart again, right? Um, um, he, Pharaoh hard, uh, hardened or, or, or weighted down um, his, his own heart, and that's the way but, it is before. It's right, this is what, what the boils is when God finally steps in. And this, of course, has been a classic subject of, of, uh, of discussion. You know, if God is making him do this, it's not his fault. That's the famous question. Right. But so, is it true then that Pharaoh is, quote, a stiff-necked Pharaoh? Yes. Right. Pharaoh, Pharaoh gets himself into this situation. And then the question is... Um, what what is what what are his alternatives? Does he still have choice or not? So some people read it as he's gotten himself so he's dug himself so deep in that he no longer can get himself out. That's what it means that Pharaoh, uh, that God hardens his heart, that he he no longer has his, his ownership over his own feelings, because he's he's you know he's destroyed his own power of choice by choosing to constantly harden his heart. That's one way to look at it. That's one answer that people uh, give. Um, and that's something that unfortunately we see in life. If people persist on making the choices that they make, then theoretically they might have a free will to, you know, to, to choose differently the next time around, but it becomes increasingly difficult to break the habit to break the, the, the way that you are, you know, constantly 
uh, living your life. Very, very hard, very hard. Um, After the hail, let's also back to, um, on page 368, verse 35, we're back to, so Pharaoh's heart stiffened. Right. So, okay, good. So we see that, that that's, um, you know, uh, um, yes, no, yes, no. An, an, ex an explanation that I think is um, actually pretty, a, a pretty good explanation. I've shared it in Torah Sparks over the years is that God is helping Pharaoh do what Pharaoh wants to do. And this is the, this is, this is the tragic thing. Um, and this is why we're scratching our heads to this day. Why don't the people that we disagree with, um, why don't they get it? Why don't they change? And the, the, the factor for a lot of people is they are really cussedly committed to what they uh, are, are, in, are engaged in. It's not that they're being misled. It's not that they're, you know, poor victims of, of a demagogue. They really, really, this is how they see their own dignity. This is how they see their own freedom. And then you could make it so painful for them to do it that they might back down. Unless they decide to martyr themselves for what they believe in. When we see people who martyr themselves for values that we believe in, then the martyr is a hero. If a person refuses to give in, you know, uh, um, for the sake of, of uh, you know, something uh, uh, truthful and noble and, and, uh, and good, and they even are ready to lose their lives, then that person is a, a holy martyr, a hero for us. What if that person, what if a different person refuses to give in and is totally committed to evil? And you try to tell them to stop it and you try to persuade them not to and you start exerting force and you say, you know, if you keep on doing this evil stuff, you'll suffer. So the rational thing would be, okay, you know what? There comes a point where it's just not worth it for me to do this. I'm not gonna do it because why should I suffer? And then there's somebody who is so believing in what they uh, uh, are committed to that they're willing to suffer for their belief, except in this case, the belief is a terrible belief. So what some people have explained is when God helps Pharaoh, when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, what God is doing is helping Pharaoh overcome all of the disincentives for Pharaoh to not do what he believes in, right? In other words, Pharaoh really wants to be a, uh, a, a tyrant, an oppressor, a murderer. He really wants to do that. He wants to be Pharaoh. He wants to be Pharaoh. And then God is making it harder and harder for him. So at some point, Pharaoh could say, you know what, I think I would rather keep on enslaving and killing these Israelites, but it's too hard. So I'll make the bargain. And then God says, Pharaoh, do you wanna be Pharaoh or do you wanna be a chicken? Do you wanna give in or do you wanna really be who you are? And that's hardening Pharaoh's heart. So that Pharaoh then says, you know what? Damn it, I'm still gonna stick to this. I don't care how much trouble it causes me. I'm still going to do it. This is the kind of outlaw mentality that in many ways is actually a, like a big, um, you know, a motif of, 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 of heroes in America. You know, Bonnie and Clyde kind of thing. Um, you know, where we admire the outlaw. You know, the outlaw is turning his life into, into, into garbage. The outlaw is bringing pain and suffering and destruction wherever they go, but they're a free spirit and they're honest to themselves. Didn't, didn't Trump um, enamor himself to millions of people because of that? 
he's not backing down. He's not being politically correct. He's not, he's not stifling what he says. Yes, what he says is totally ugly and disgusting, but look at how he's not ashamed. Look at how he's not afraid. That's the way some people explain what this hardening of the heart is. Audrey. Uh, um, but then why, why would God do that? Like, why would God do that? I don't get that. It says in line, in chapter seven, line three, God is saying, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and marvels in the land of Egypt when, so that they'll see that God is stronger than Pharaoh. Right. So that's a little bit what I tried to allude to also in the, in the Torah Sparks. What God is saying is that I'm going to have to make this as painfully clear as possible. Because unfortunately, there are too many people out there that are pharaohs. And they're not going to give in unless the, the, uh, um, you know, the, the pressure against them is overwhelming. Now, this is a dangerous idea. And it causes tremendous suffering to the, to the Egyptian people. Pharaoh could have prevented it, but Pharaoh rationally still says, it's more important to me to be Pharaoh mm -hmm. than to be good. Um, so in you know, the shock and, I, I just went, you know, we, we wanted to do a shock and awe thing, you know, when we went into Iraq. It was this idea, we are gonna so overwhelm them with our might and with our, you know, uh, our, our strength that they'll just be beaten into submission. What happens here is it's a story that we have to grapple with. And the difference also is, is that it's not us, it's God. And it's all about this, this beginning uh, unfolding of the rest of the world watching this and the rest of us over the generations reading this and going, we have a choice. Either we take God's path or we take Pharaoh's path. And what I was trying to say this week is, don't take it for granted that it's obvious to people which path to take. I wanted to point out that I mean, to, when Geraldine pointed out on, on page 357, God's saying, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. But then he doesn't have to because right. they have Pharaoh stiffened his own heart. He stiffened his own heart. To me, the message is that God couldn't have hardened Pharaoh's heart if Pharaoh wasn't inclined to have his heart hardened. All right. That and would be one way to look at it. Right. Over and over. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you say that very quickly, please? <laughs> that was a tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to adjourn for today. Yes, to everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back together again another time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good week, everyone. Yes, Shalom, Chodesh Tov.